Kind of good. And then, so we will just get started. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Granton. I'm the Director of Science and Research at Women's Voices for the Earth. Um, and welcome to our period product label reading 101. Um, I want to thank you all for, for joining us this evening. Um, I know people were joining from around the world, so depending on your time zone, good evening or afternoon or morning, we're really happy to have you with us. Um, just as a note, you've probably heard this through Zoom, we're recording this session and we will send out a link um, to the recording in the follow-up email, so you'll be able to share that uh, with other folks. Um, I'll be presenting for about half an hour or 40 minutes, um, and then we're going to have some time for Q&A. So if you have um, questions as I go along, we have muted everyone, um, but we will please enter your questions in the chat and then we'll get to them at the end. We'll be reading those out at the end. So um, please do that. We'd love to hear what your, what your uh, feedback and, and questions are. We are, we are really thrilled to see um, uh, so much interest in this topic. We had a good uh, turnout. Um, we hope today we can provide you some information um, helpful that's helpful to help you navigate period product choices, but also really hoping to engage you in some of the work we need still need to do to ensure that these products are safer with transparently disclosed ingredients and make sure that that becomes the norm. Um, there's definitely some work to do on that. We can't do it alone. This is where your voices, your participation will make all the difference. And we're kind of at a pivotal point right now um, to make our needs uh, known to companies that, that make these products. Um, so first, um, just to, we, I know we've got a few folks with us who are maybe new to Women's Voices for the Earth. I just want to briefly tell you who we are. Um, we are an environmental health organization that's based here in the U.S. and our mission is to amplify women's voices to eliminate the toxic chemicals that harm our health and communities. Um, so what do we do? Uh, very briefly, we particularly work on toxic chemicals found in household products which are disproportionately used by women and girls. So our four main programs, as you see here, are cleaning products, salon products, and cosmetics. Um, what's most relevant today is intimate care products, which is both period products as well as other vaginal care products like douches, wipes, and sprays. Um, and fragrance, which is our fourth category, which really crosses over all of the other three. Um, all of these products can in fact and, and often are fragrance. Um, and we do our work in a number of ways. We do research and education on the types of chemicals you find in these products and what they may be doing to our health. Um, we have corporate campaigns where we, you know, involves talking directly with companies and then taking, you know, getting folks to take actions with companies to get them to think differently about how they use chemicals uh, in their products. We do some leadership development and organizing around our campaigns. Um, and then we also do policy work. We do with both state and federal um, legislation, largely around the regulation of toxic chemicals um, in these products, and then laws encouraging greater ingredient transparency, which is one of the things we're here uh, to talk about today. Um, so that was a really quick overview. I encourage folks who are new to, to, to weave uh, to look at our website, womensvoices.org, and uh, browse around there to, to learn some more about what we do. Um, so why are we here today? Um, what, what do we want to know? Um, why, why do we want to know the ingredients in period products? And this is actually a question we were asked by manufacturers years ago in conversations when we first started asking them for information on what their products were made of. Um, and they told us at the time that their customers had never asked for this information before um, and you know, really questioned why, why they would even want to know. And truly, a lot of folks who menstruate really haven't given it a lot of thought. Um, you find a product that works for you. You maybe you know suffer through the, a couple uncomfortable days a month. If it works, great. Um, and there's not much more to it. But of course, there is more to it. Um, there's more to it, uh, more than whether just not the product works. Um, you're putting this product either adjacent to or inside your body at one of the most sensitive and absorptive areas um, in your body. Now, vaginal and vulvar skin is really unique compared to other parts of your body. There are mucous membranes, which allows for different kinds of, of absorption. Um, there's an entirely unique microbiome, and the microbiome is that careful balance of healthy bacteria um, that keeps a, a vagina healthy. There's actually a, a separate related but actually different microbiome for the vulva. Um, these are really important um, to keep intact and really different from any other skin um, on your body, which has a totally separate microbiome as well. 
Um, there's a lot of well, blood vessels um, down there. This gives direct access to our circulatory system. So chemicals coming in through this route can get circulated around the body very easily. Um, and then there are certain types of chemicals like hormones, which are actually absorbed much better through vaginal tissue than through other parts of our body. So, uh, you know, multiple times more absorption going on. Um, and then there's some evidence that when this absorption happens, particularly for hormones, it, there's a direct transfer to the uterus, right? We don't fully understand how this works. Um, we certainly know that it works for, for vaginal contraceptives, for example, um, but it is an, you know, an, an interesting and unique um, uh, fact about about this route of exposure. So it's it's really unique, and it, it's a part of our body that's not. It's it's really poorly researched, unfortunately. There's a lot that we don't know, but we are concerned that period products and other intimate care products can lead to these multiple chemical exposures, um, and we're concerned that these what, about what these chemical exposures may have on our health. What kind of impacts um, they they may have? Hey, Alex. Yeah. Can I just pause up? Um, it, I don't know where your mic is, but it sounds like it's like rubbing against your clothes or something. So I, I apologize. I think I can. No, it's okay. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Um, so here's a, let me let's get into a little bit of the the history of period product ingredient disclosure in the US because not that long ago you couldn't find out any ingredients in these products um, and there is still to this day no federal law requiring ingredients um, to be listed on the package um, we didn't find this to be acceptable so we started a campaign back in 2014 called detox the box um, and we got thousands of um, folks to call and email um, companies asking them for their ingredients. We had a little viral dance video, which uh, was really fun to, to bring some attention to this issue. Um, a year later in 2015, we held a rally at the corporate headquarters of Always and, and Tampax um, during their shareholder meeting. Um, and this rally was very successful. They actually started voluntarily disclosing some of the ingredients in these products on their website that very morning. Um, sort of, you know, not, not probably not a coincidence uh, that it happened on the same day. Um, so that was a great win getting us information on these products, but we knew that what we were getting was not quite um, everything that we needed. There was, there was more information that we needed about these products. So a few years later, uh, 2019, there was an opportunity for some state legislation and a New York state law passed, um, which for the first time in the nation required all ingredients and period products to be disclosed on the package. Um, a year later, a California state law passed um, and this law had some weaker language in it, um, it was still requiring ingredients to be disclosed, but specifically allowed companies to hide some of their ingredients. We did not feel this was in the public's interest um, uh, to, to be to, for companies to be able to be allowed to, to hide ingredients. Um, and um, what we've been seeing this year, um, likely in anticipation of the New York law going into effect, um, we've started to see more ingredients. Um, available on websites um, and packages, which is which has been exciting and, and really new information. And now we're up to October 2021. The New York law just literally went into effect this month. Um, so it is now law for, for the ingredients to be on packages for the very first time. Um, and this is just the, the history in the US. There's been some amazing work around the world um, internationally. I know in, in the EU and France, there was a, a tremendous um, online petition that, that um, gained a lot of signatures asking for uh, ingredient disclosure. Tremendous work in South Korea in 2017 that got them some ingredients on the package there. Um, so all around the world, these you know, particularly multinational corporations selling these products have been hearing from their customers that um, that they want to know more about what's in these products. And these voices really created um, the change that we're starting to see today. So let's look at what we are in fact starting to see. All right, so this is um, kind of a before and after of the online disclosure on pads. This is one particular brand. Um, and on the left, you'll see the before. Um, this is the, um, uh, what they were disclosing voluntarily, and you know, it, it was it wasn't bad. There was definitely some some information here we didn't have before, but there's still some 
fairly vague um, uh, ingredients such as absorbent gel, absorbent foam. We don't really know what those are. We, we knew it could be better. Um, on the right, you'll see now, it's a much longer list of, of chemicals. They're really um, quite specific. Um, there are new categories of chemicals that weren't even mentioned before. So there's a whole list of kind of coatings that are um, there to, to, to aid with wicking of fluid. You know, there's no mention of these additives before that they were even on these pads. There's a whole list of pigments and colorants. Again, these were never mentioned uh, before. Obviously, you could see the colors on the on the pads, but they were never disclosing them before. So this is really a step in the right direction. We're we're seeing more information being disclosed about these products, and and it was a real surprise to learn sort of how complex these products really are. We've been given the impression they were really much more simple. Um, than they are. Um, but there's really a, potentially a lot of um, ingredients um, that are, you know, brand new uh, to us that we're starting to see. Um, I have a few more examples of pad ingredients here. Um, and you can see there's a real variety in, in how ingredients are being disclosed. Um, some companies are talking about what they're made without, like without dyes, without fragrances. Um, some are just, you know, listing a whole bunch of ingredients, some of which, again, very new, uh, newly disclosed. Some products are more simple, just containing kind of organic cotton, plant cellulose. Um, so there's a real, you can see some real distinctions um, in, in pads, yeah. particularly as to how, um, how uh, uh, complicated or simple, you know, they are. Um, let me show you some tampon disclosure. So this is again, this kind of that before and after online disclosure. Um, before they were voluntarily disclosing these four ingredients, they talked a little bit about the applicator. Um, uh, they mentioned colorants, but don't say what they are. Um, now it's a little bit more specific. They've kind of revamped kind of the purpose of, of these ingredients. Um, they've added an addition of paraffin wax, which wasn't mentioned before, a pigment that wasn't mentioned before. Um, so we're getting, again, a little bit more information um, about tampons than, than uh, we were seeing before. And I've got a few more examples. Here we go. Um, so again, there's some real um, differences in, in what these products are made of. There's a real variety. Some, it's just pretty much straight up organic cotton and not much else. Um, some of them have a lot more. You'll see two of these examples on the left have this mysterious category called fiber finishes. This is very vague. Um, it could be just about anything. Um, and that's you know not telling you very much about their product um, to know that there are fiber finishes. Um, on the right, this sort of chart um, example, it gives some examples of what some of these fiber finishes might be. Again, it talks about coatings that help fibers wick fluid. Um, these have oxalated ingredients, um, stearates, there's, there's titanium dioxide, which is a, a colorant. These are all relatively newly, um, newly disclosed. Some products have these additional additives and some don't. All right, moving on to some of our other categories. Um, so period underwear ingredients. Um, here you'll see um, ingredients listed almost more often kind of similar to how you see ingredients listed in clothing. Um, uh, sometimes it separates it out by what's in the body, what's in the, the gusset layer. Um, a few things to note um, about period underwear and to look for. There's two um, things that the um, ingredients on the right, as well as um, that sort of line on the bottom, um, talk about adding um, an antimicrobial additive, um, particularly silver, um, to these products. The idea is to add it um, with the intent of, of killing off odor-causing bacteria. There's very little evidence that it, it actually um, uh, affects odor in any way. Odor really shouldn't be a problem in the first place. Um, and you don't want anything antimicrobial in your underwear. I mean, it's, it's just a bad idea um, in, in a place where you've got such a sensitive and, and careful balance of, of microbes um, that you don't want to be killing off, right? Um, you, don't need a, you don't need a pesticide in, in your underwear. So that's a real red flag um, to see kind of that silver additive or any, any mention of antimicrobial um, additives. 
Um, some of these products are really just simply more cotton. Um, again, the one on the right at the bottom, if you can see it, it talks about dyes, but without really telling what they are. And it also talks about these finishes. Um, one red flag, it talks about a water repellent finish. Um, this could be, you've probably heard of these forever chemicals called PFAS. Um, these have been found in period underwear. We're not seeing anyone directly um, disclosing yet that they've included PFAS, but a water repellent finish is a potential red flag for that. That's one where we need to contact this company and find out what in fact um, is, in, is in their product and, and what are they using. Because um, because PFAS has enormous um, enormous uh, potential health effects um, that can come from that. So again, there's a real a real variety in, in what these um, can be made of, and, and a real variety in, in how these ingredients are disclosed. Um, menstrual cups much simpler. It's inherently a much more simple product. Um, generally, what you're seeing is one ingredient, medical grade silicone. That's um, pretty much what we're seeing. I did find one menstrual cup that was made of latex. So that was important information to know. Certainly there are people with latex allergies. You don't wanna use one. So it's very important to have that information. Um, you'll notice that some of the um, ingredient listings um, specifically mentioned that they don't use dyes and they're, you know, tend to be sort of clear, um, clear cups. Um, the two ingredient listings that I list here that don't mention that they don't include dyes were actually colored cups, um, but they don't seem to be disclosing any dyes, which presumably are part of the silicone. So um, we'll be keeping an, an eye on that to see whether or not there's um, going to be more disclosure there um, on dyes. Um, all right. So Overall, what should you be looking out for? And I'm sure there, there are people here who are, you know, looking for some specifics, um, wanting to know what, um, what ingredients we really um, need to, to know about, um, what, you know, what, which, which products should I be avoiding? Um, right now, it's really difficult to give you that kind of specific information. Um, right now, we, we still don't have a full idea of all the different ingredients that are included in these products. Literally, the information is changing every day. I, I saw some today that had new information that, that were not there. It wasn't there a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, so, uh, and many of these ingredients we don't know much about. There's very little um, research on these chemicals as far as vaginal exposure goes and what, what the impacts are. So there's a lot of research that, that needs to be done to better understand um, these exposures. And of course, the disclosures aren't fully out there either. We don't think that all companies are fully disclosing yet. Um, we're trying to get a handle um, on that as well. Um, but what I can give you is kind of these general guidelines of what we do now until we know more, until we've got more specifics on these ingredients. Um, first of all, I would look for simplicity. That is, is, is going to be your best guide. The, the products that are the simplest are least likely to have um, an adverse chemical effect. Um, so you wanna look for ones with fewer or no additives, right? Um, you wanna look for these fewer coatings that, you know, that, that allow for, for, for wicking. We don't know what these chemicals um, are in fact doing. Um, avoid fragrance, um, certainly. We know that fragrance can, can, be very, can be a real irritant, it can be an allergen. You can avoid dyes, which can also have um, some issues. There are certain dyes that aren't appropriate for, for use on mucous membranes, and we haven't discovered whether or not those are being used in these products or not. Um, certainly avoid any antimicrobials um, or mention of silver. These are things you don't want um, near your, your very sensitive um, uh, vaginal microbiomes. Um, these uh, you know, can, can affect that, potentially could, could upset it. Um, which can lead to other adverse health effects. So looking for simplicity is, 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 a, good, is a good rule, certainly, for now. Um, you also want to look for specificity, right? Um, finding pro companies that are disclosing their products with actual chemical names that you can look up, right? Um, rather than these generic terms like fiber finishes. You want, you want to be buying from companies that are telling you what is actually in their products not sort of glossing over what might actually be in their products. Um, and you want to look for companies that are, in fact, offering additional information on their ingredient standards. You want companies to tell you why they're, you know, not including fragrances or not including dyes, um, why they're using some ingredients and not other, and, and how, how exactly are they assuring the safety of their products? 
Um, you won't always get all these answers, um, you know, from the box. And if you're not sure, ask the company. This is where your voice is so, so important. Um, it is, um, uh, this is what these companies are, are doing right now. It's such a critical time um, because, you know, the, the New York law has just come on um, um, into effect. These companies are figuring out how they're disclosing um, their ingredients. And as they're doing that, they're asking themselves, what exactly do our customers want to know? Right. Um, and that's really important. They want to know what you want to know. And it, it helps if you ask. Um, this doesn't have to be a confrontational thing. They all have, you know, 1 800 numbers. They all have email and, you know, kind of online um, uh, customer service. Ask them about the ingredients in their products, especially if they're vague, for example. Um, if you do choose, you know, a different product because you, you didn't like the fact that they weren't giving you enough information, please let them know, please let the company know that because that will make a difference um, in the long run as well. So really using your voice, asking companies um, about, uh, about the ingredients in their products um, will make a huge difference. And hopefully, eventually I will be able to give you more specifics on what chemicals we need, we absolutely need to be getting out of these products. Some of these ingredients are probably going to be fine. Um, some of them are going to be more problematic. Um, and in order to find that out, we need to do some research. Again, I'm going to ask for your help on this. Um, we're about to start a field study on period product labels. Um, and we need volunteers to help us. So this is going to involve going to your local store, finding out what products are there, and finding out and reporting back on what you're finding on the labels. Um, if you've you know attended this webinar, you'll get a follow-up email with information on how to participate, how to get trained to, to be involved in this field study. Um, the goals are, are multiple. Um, it's really gathering um, information that we don't already have. For one, we're going to want some volunteers in New York State um, to confirm the companies are in fact complying with the disclosure law. We want to know if their companies aren't, disclo aren't disclosing, if their products being sold where you can't get information on ingredients. Um, but we know that the products that are you know, labeled for New York are probably getting sold other places too. So we want to find out where these other New York compliant products are showing up on shelves. Who's getting this information and who isn't, right? Where, where, where are these um, discrepancies happening? Because we really, we want everyone to have um, this information. And then of course, lastly, we really want to find out more about what ingredients are being disclosed. A broader range of products. There are so many new brands um, out there now. There are a lot of generic brands out there um, that we haven't been able to track. So um, because the law especially um, only requires it on packages, some of these um, brands, particularly generic brands, don't even have websites where we can, where we can check ingredients. We need some pictures of these of these uh, products. So, um, if you'd be interested in that, I hope you will be. Um, we'd love to have some volunteers um, join us in in that field study, um, and then hopefully from that we will in fact have you know better information for um, for you all um, down the line. Because really we can't we can't make these changes alone. Um, and I think uh, companies do want to give information to their to their customers that it, their that their customers want. So we have to demand uh, the information. Um, and you are all a, a major, a major part of this. Um, and, and, and it's gonna be it's gonna be exciting to kind of get a sense of the state of ingredient disclosure right now. It's really, you know, uh, changed so much just in you know the last seven years from nothing to quite a bit. Um, but we think there's, you know, there's gonna be improvement that's gonna be made. Um, and we think companies will be changing how they're disclosing um, over time with, with some feedback. Um, so I think that is the last slide in my presentation. Um, I think we've got some great um, questions, hopefully. Um, if you yes. have questions. Yeah. I have some questions for you, Alex. Um, and also just a reminder, if, if anybody else has any questions that they'd like to ask Alex, um, please drop them in the chat and we'll be um, answering those. But the first one that we have is from Vanessa, um, who's asking, um, why is silver bad? Uh, I thought it was a natural, I thought it was natural and there are so many products with silver that you applied to cold sores and irritating skin um, and orally. 
Oh, it's a great, great question. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, yeah, so silver is one of those interesting um, uh, interesting ingredients. It is often advertised as natural. I mean, silver is, uh, you know, a, a natural element, you know, in, in the world. Um, it is very antimicrobial. It's quite potent in terms of um, that it can kill bacteria. So it's been used in, in a number of things where you're trying to, to control bacteria. Um, here, there's, there's a few issues with, with silver. So in this case, um, with period underwear, which is where we're seeing it. And actually, we're seeing it in some, there's certain brands of disposable pads that have some silver in them as well. The goal of adding the silver is to add this antimicrobial layer with the claim that it will kill off bacteria that causes odor. Now, there's a few issues here. One is that odor really should shouldn't be a problem. The, these companies are, you know, sort of banking on the fact that you're worried about period odor, um, that you're concerned about it, and they're going to tell you, yeah, this is something you need to be concerned about. It's not something you need concerned about. You smell just fine, right? Um, but um, so it's it's really just unnecessary. I mean, you know, we don't have antimicrobial underwear any other time, you know, um, most pads are not antimicrobial. Um, this just hasn't, it, you know, it, it's, it's a problem that doesn't, need, it doesn't really exist. It's a problem that doesn't need to be solved. And the problem is that silver is very potent and silver can kill lactobacillus. It's quite potent against lactobacillus. Lactobacillus is one of the very important healthy bacteria in the vaginal microbiome. So having um, this, you know, silver additive very close to that, you know, to, to this area with the sensitive microbiome, it's just, it's just not a, not a great idea. Um, and it's not, you know, it's unnecessary. Um, the other thing about silver is that there's been this real proliferation of using silver um, in, in products. Like you, you'll see it in, in a number of um, uh, uh, mostly athletic wear kind of in fabrics. And again, it's sort of this idea like, oh, it'll kill bacteria. And then, you know, it, you're, you won't smell when you go to the gym, you know, after you've been to the gym. Well, you know, you're going to go to the gym and your clothes are going to smell and you're going to have to wash them, which should take care of it, right? Um, that, will, that, will, that will do it. You don't need the silver. And what happens is the silver gets washed out um, and it gets spread around um, through our waterways. It ends up in our environment. And then you've got these tiny little bits of silver. Think of it like glitter, right? <laughs> um, you know, it kind of goes everywhere. It's really hard to clean up. It's almost impossible to clean up. And then you have these little bits of silver that are kind of traveling around our environment, affecting bacteria where we don't want them to be affecting bacteria. Um, they're kind of out, out of our control. So it's really causing this, this persistent pollution problem um, of using too much silver. So in, in this case, it's really unnecessary in period products. Um, and then it's potentially affecting, you know, potentially affecting your own health and potentially affecting um, the environment as well. So I hope that that answers that silver question, but it's a, it's a really good question because it is, it can be confusing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. I have a few more questions. Um, uh, the next one is, uh, is ingredient disclosure available and required outside of New York? Ah, okay, good question. So um, there is the, the New York law, if, you, if a company sells um, ingredient, uh, sells period products in New York, then they're required to disclose. If a company does not sell in New York and they're just selling other parts of the country, then they are not required um, to disclose. Um, there is the California law that passed. It has not gone into effect yet. So um, there's no uh, requirement yet in California um, to disclose. So it, right now it's only New York. Um, what we understand from you know, lots of kind of state laws that get passed like this, companies generally you know, sell across the country they're very unlikely to make different labels just for New York than for other. It's just too hard to kind of control the supply chain um, and get the, you know, the right labels to the right stores. If they're changing it for New York, they're gonna change it you know, sort of across the board. Um, but since it's only gone into effect just this month, we don't know sort of how, you know, they're probably you know, supplying the New York stores first. Um, we don't know how, um, how much the um, ingredients are being seen in other places around the country. Um, we think everyone, you know, no matter where you live, deserves this information. Um, so we hope it'll be, um, you know, certainly more widespread um, soon. 
Um, there, there is um, the potential for a um, federal bill. Um, we're hoping it will it will be introduced soon, um, which would require um, uh, ingredients, you know, across the board um, in 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 every state. So. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and then I have another question. Again, just a reminder for folks who are part of this webinar. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll um, be asking those for you. But I would love to hear uh, hear you talk more, Alex, about like maybe pesticides in period products and, and some of those that we have found. Sure, yeah. No, this is definitely an issue that's um, that's come up. There's only been a little bit of research on um, on pesticides. They're often um, associated with cotton products. Um, both tampons and pads can have cotton in them. Um, if it's not organic cotton, which kind of you know removes a lot of the the pesticides, then you can get some pesticides in there. And there are a few studies that have shown levels of some of these concerning pesticides commonly used on cotton ending up in the pads. Um, you'll see a lot of companies talk about how they purify their cotton or they screen their cotton. It's really unclear. There's no um, requirement that, that they, these products be, um, be pesticide free. Um, but some, some companies are, you know, doing some really good testing and talking about the testing that they're doing. Um, so if you're, if you, if you are using a cotton product and you're concerned about um, these sort of, you know, pesticides that are used to grow in cotton ending up in their product, Call the company, right? Call the company and, and ask them what they're doing. Are they screening their, their cotton for, for pesticides? Are they making sure that, that it's not going to be in there? Because that is, is also a concern. I mean, pesticides, you know, they can kill my, micro, you know, important microbes um, in the vagina and, and in the vulva. They can get into your system and cause all kinds of other, um, other potential health issues. So that's definitely one that we want to that we want to screen out as well. Looks like there are a couple more questions in the chat, I think. Maria? Yes. Um, Denise says um, if you could talk about other ingredients such as like uh, polypropylene and polyester or other ingredients that we might have found on there. Great. Yeah, no, really, really, really good point. What we did find um, in uh, a lot of, certainly a lot of the, the pads and then also in, in the tampons as well are, are these chemicals like polypropylene and polyester. These, you know, are polyethylene. Um, a lot of these are basically plastics, right? Um, we know that, that um, pads particularly, um, some of them are heavily, <laughs> heavily made of plastics and you can kind of see those listed um, now more clearly than, than you could before. Um, we don't know too much about what the impacts of these plastics are on, you know, uh, on our health, um, but we do have a pretty good idea of what they're doing to our environment. I mean, certainly, you know, these they're, these are, you know, one-time disposable products ending up in the landfill that will last a very, very long time because of the plastics that are that are in them. Um, so finding products that don't have plastic or don't have as much plastic, even um, What's been been interesting um, is some companies are disclosing, you know, not only what the products are made of, but also what the wrappers are made of and what the box is made of, and you know, how, how, talking about that that packaging, um, and and that's been really important to a lot of consumers too, who want to make sure they're not, you know, sort of creating this or you know, furthering the plastic problem we have um, in our environment. There's actually been some some pushback from companies saying, well, we don't need to disclose, you know, ingredients and in, say the tampon applicators or in the wrappers or in the, you know, the the the, um, the boxes because these don't have or they very, you know, transient exposure to the skin, transient exposure to the body. These aren't important ingredients, um, but of course they are important ingredients um, because they, because certainly they will affect the environment in the long term. So. Um, Knowing that and learning um, more about that is really important. And again, this is feedback we need to get um, to these companies, you know, to, that, that packaging is also important and they can change the way that these things are packaged. And there's really a lot of innovation in, um, in period product packaging recently um, to, to move away from the plastic, which, um, which is exciting and hopefully a trend that will continue. Thank you. Um, and 
the next question that I have is uh, from Durley, I believe. Um, and is it, a, she's, they're asking, um, is it necessary that products are white? Is this a cultural thing? So I wonder, Alex, if you can talk to a little bit about like bleached products and um, chlorine in, in products that we've seen. Yeah, no, it's a, this is a great question. And I, I think this probably is a cultural thing. You know, certainly uh, pretty much across the board, these products are white. Um, and the, the um, you know, ingredients that they're made of may not intentionally, you know, may not originally be white, but, you know, they, they are whitened. Um, for a long time, there was concern about these ingredients um, being, uh, particularly pads and tampons being bleached with chlorine, because that's, you know, very, very cheap and easy way to, to make something very, very white is using chlorine. The problem with using chlorine is that it can lead to these other contaminants that are involved. Um, so things like dioxins and furans, really, really quite um, potent toxic chemicals. Um, dioxins have been um, linked to endometriosis, which is, you know, a, a, a disease of the endometrium. So these are, you know, you don't want dioxin in, in this area of, of your body. Um, a lot of that has been, um, been curbed to some degree. You'll see a lot of companies talking about chlorine-free processes um, for, their, for their bleaching, which is great. There's sort of total chlorine free and elemental chlorine free. Um, elemental chlorine free is not quite as good. There's still a little bit of dioxin there. It's better than it was um, before, but testing that's been done recently is still finding these um, dioxin contaminants in, in some products. So if you can find um, just, you know, total chlorine free um, uh, products, then, then that's great. Um, the, the, the idea around these products being white. I, you know, it's, it keeps kind of oh, going back to, to this issue of, you know, these are sanitary. This is, you know, these have to be clean that, you know, the, your period is dirty and therefore we're going to give you these white products to, to clean them up with. Um, it really kind of perpetuates um, the stigma of there being something wrong with a perfectly natural, uh, perfectly natural process. And I think these very white products are kind of um, uh, uh, part of, you know, part of that. Um, but you know, certainly not not necessary to the to the function of, of these products. Um, maybe you know, maybe one day we'll you know we'll see see some in, in you know sort of a more natural color. Um, but certainly for now, as far as marketing goes, this is what you know what what they're uh, what they're putting out there. Um, but it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a totally valid question. There's no, certainly no reason it needs to be, these products need to be white. Um, and we're seeing certainly, you know, we, some of the ingredients we saw um, in the products were, you know, white pigments and titanium dioxide, you know, so they're adding these extra um, uh, pigments to make the, make these products more white really for no, for no reason um, and adding additional chemical exposures in the process. Yeah, that's a really big concern um, that we have. Uh, I think, Alex, I would definitely like to ask you one more question, um, but maybe we could fit into depending on time. But um, you talked about stigma. And so um, we wanted to, I wanted to ask, like, how does stigma around talking about menstruation impact progress on this issue? Mm -hmm. Oh, really, really good question. Um, there is cultural stigma against menstruation, you know, across the world here and, and in, in other places. Um, we are taught to conceal our menstruation, not let anyone know we've got our period, you know, heaven forbid we leak and someone notices, right? Um, it is, um, we're being taught it, 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 that it's a, a shameful thing. Of course, it's a perfectly natural and in fact, very healthy process um, that, our, that our bodies go through um, that, you know, there, there's nothing we can do about it or that, you know, to, to cause it or, or whatever. Um, but there is this stigma that, that um, you know, it's embarrassing and you, and you want to hide it. You want the sort of the, the quietest product and it really affects how these products are made, how they are marketed, how we feel about them, how we feel about ourselves um, uh, when, when we have our, our periods. And it, it is also really hampered research on, on these issues. I mean, even you know, anything that has to do with the vagina, the vulva, 
people don't want to talk about it in polite company. It doesn't get the the um, the um, research, you know, dollars um, don't go into this kind of research. So there's a lot that we don't know. There are so many things wrapped in um, to that stigma that are hampering our ability to better understand these products um, and uh, and to, to better under, understand these um, exposures. I think it's also, you know, a main reason why, you know, these companies said before, like, well, no one ever asked us about our ingredients before, you know, um, people don't like to talk about these products. They don't even like to talk to the companies they buy them from, right? Um, and people don't often want to talk to their doctors about about their their any issues they have with with menstruation. So um, it's it's something that um, really needs to be tackled. It's a real you know up, uphill battle. Um, but uh, you know we we've been working on it, um, trying to get more open and honest conversations happening about um, about menstruation that can kind of ease people's concerns, ease people's um, worry or shame about this very, very natural uh, process and, and healthy process that, that, um, that happens uh, in our bodies. And the more people are talking about it and comfortable talking about it, um, you know, the, the, the better they're gonna feel personally about it and the easier we'll be able to, to um, you know, get laws passed and, um, and, and get these products, uh, you know, to, to the safer place where they need to be. Yeah, and um, I would also encourage people to have conversations with other folks, right, about their periods, um, the, their experiences with their periods, just like the type of periods that they have or have had, because that's really truly how we start to destigmatize those, right? Um, so, yeah, well, thank you so much, Alex. Um, I think uh, those are all of the questions that we'll ask for today, and we'll let you keep going. Okay. Um, we do love feedback and we really appreciate it. So we've got this quick um, feedback form. I hope we can get that in the, the form in the chat, the link to the form. It's just three questions, really simple. We'd like to, like to know what you thought um, about, this, uh, about this webinar and, and you know, we want to offer similar things um, in the future. Um, and I do also um, want to remind you that we, you will be getting a follow-up um, email from uh, this session. Um, again, you know, probably with, the, with this form too, if you haven't already filled it out, um, but with information on how to get involved in the field study, because um, we would love to have some volunteers um, get us more, you know, help us with more information um, on that. Um, and we've got several other ways to get involved um, in the work we do. Um, as Marie was, was telling us, um, you know, so we support and encourage open and honest conversations about menstruation um, to, to reduce the stigma and to, to, to move forward progress. Um, again, I've said this over and over again, your voice is so important. You wanna question the products that you're using. Um, and talk to, you know, talk to the companies about the products. And certainly for yourself, it's really an important thing. Don't suffer in silence, you know, feel free to try out other products and compare. There's a lot of um, interesting anecdotal data anyway about people changing products and then having a different period experience and, and, and sometimes a better one. Um, so it's really worth, you know, not just assuming you'll be miserable for, for a couple of days a month, it might be better, you know, when you when you look at different products. And there's really a, a nice variety out there now. Um, on our website, you can we've got a period health newsletter you can subscribe to. Um, I'll just mention briefly our our story, our flow workshops. We have these from time to time, and they're posted on our on our website. And these are kind of these conversations about uh, menstruation, where people get. We've had a lot of online ones. I'm hoping eventually to be doing some some in person ones as well. Um, so look at our, on our website, you can learn more about those, about those workshops. They've been a, a, a great way of, of, of sharing information with one, one another about um, healthy menstruation. And then you know, lastly is contact companies. You, we need your voices telling these companies what you want in your, in your products, asking them questions about their safety um, standards and um, about their ingredients. Um, and then lastly, you know, Donating to Weave to, to help support this work is, is very important. Um, we need your, both, your, both your voices and, and your dollars um, to keep this work going. And then lastly, we would love you to stay in touch. We've got all these different ways to, to communicate with you. 
Um, and we hope that you all will stay stay in touch. Just want to make sure, Maria, are there any new any questions that we need to to answer, or have we got all the questions? We had a couple of new ones come oh, through, okay. um, and I think yeah. they might be good to answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so good. one of them is. Um, someone is asking about silicone in menstrual cups, if this is the safest option or if there are any problems with it that you have seen. Interesting. Yeah, we're, we're, we're you know, trying to, to figure that out. Um, there's been a little bit of testing on, um, on menstrual cups and it's, it's, but not a lot. So we don't know too much about it. Generally, silicone should be relatively inert. Um, we have heard of some issues where it's, you know, absorbed something from the packaging, you know, and then, and then that's been a concern. Certainly with menstrual cups, you do want to boil them when you get them um, first, and that will, will help reduce any residue that might be on the, on the, um, on the menstrual cup. Um, but we think overall it should be relatively um, inert, but, you know, we're, we're still learning um, about these products. Um, certainly silicone used in, in plenty of other medical devices as well. Um, there is, I, like I said, they were all, all the ones that I've seen ingredient disclosure for all say they're made of, of silicone, um, uh, except for one, which I saw, which was made of latex. So that is another option. Um, as long as you don't have a latex allergy, which would, would you know, certainly could be, could be quite dangerous. Um, that there is, there is one option for that. Um, but overall we seem to think it's okay, but you know, we, we need more research about what these, um, what these exposures are like. Thank you, Alex. And then the last one that I see on here is, um, have the ingredients that were causing contact dermatitis in always menstrual products changed? And maybe you could give a little background to that as well. Sure. Oh, really good question. Yeah. So there was um, actually a number of years ago, um, some uh, a study uh, that happened in Canada, they sort of published a study and there were, there were these dermatologists who were noticing they had numerous patients that had um, uh, kind of genital contact dermatitis and rashes um, that were very, very associated with women having their periods and using always pads particularly. Um, and the company at the time said, no, it's not the pads. This is just, you know, what happens. And they, they, they were refuting it, but these dermatologists are saying, it's just this brand and this is, this is what we're seeing in, in our patients. And when they change products, this contact dermatitis seems to go away. Um, whether or not the, um, the ingredients have changed is a really good question. When this study um, originally came out, there was no disclosure of ingredients, so we don't know. We don't know if they've, if they've changed. We do know that, that um, Always Brand has come out with new, new brands. They've talked about new technology and new foams and things like that, um, but we, we recently don't know if they've changed or not. Um, we certainly... Uh, have heard, you know, lots of anecdotal stories of people having um, rashes and contact dermatitis. Um, if, if this is something you experience, by all means, try another brand um, and try and find another product that that um, works for you, um, because you may you may in fact find. I mean, you know, as we've seen, you know, from the the ingredients that are disclosed so far, there are all these various coatings, some of which could be irritants, could be allergens, um, that could cause some skin uh, conditions. And they vary. I mean, these, these products really vary from having a lot of additives to not having additives. So it's worth um, trying something maybe that, you know, to, to avoid these chemicals. But um, yeah, you, you know, we assume always might have changed their ways when, you know, when they were um, uh, uh, getting those reports of, of dermatitis, but we, but we simply don't know because there wasn't any disclosure at the time. Yeah, thank you so much, Alex. That, those are all the questions that we have on here. Um, I will do a plug so that people can fill out the uh, feedback form. If you can take the next like few minutes, it's in the chat. Um, and this really helps us figure out if we're doing a good job with these events, um, if you would like to see more of these events, um, and then possibly if there's other areas that you want us to talk about or, or things that we can present on it, um, it helps us figure all of that out. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Alex. All right, well, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. This was really um, great. And thank you for some, some really excellent questions. And uh, we hope to have more of these in the future. And you know, once we get that field study done, hopefully we'll have more uh, 
even more information uh, to share with you on, um, on ways to find safer products. So thank you so much for joining us today.